things on his, on his heart that he wants to share with us. And uh, just a few things I want to, just for clarification, those of you that may be new or never been here before. Um, after our speaker is done, we usually have 15, 20 minutes of um, table discussion. So, you know, whatever God lays upon your heart to discuss. But one thing you really try to do is honor everyone's time. Um, Saturday's going to be a very busy day for people. So if any time you've got to, you know, get up and slip away, it's completely understandable. And you're excused, we don't want anyone to put they've got to wait till the very, very end. Um, and then by the same token, at 8 o'clock, we end, and we try to end uh, sharply at 8 o'clock. Just to, again, honor and respect your time and goodness you may already have. So, Greg, I want to pray with you real quick. Lord God, thank you for Greg. Thank you for his life, for his family. Lord, uh, they must have found impact on, on my family. And many of us in this room get to uh, do life with Greg each and every day, each and every week. We're so blessed. I ask you to uh, calm his heart right now, Lord. You've got a message prepared, Lord, that you're going to deliver from Greg. Help him to be a mean servant and deliver your word. Lord God, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Amen. So what you're saying is I have to stop at eight. Right? That's right. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think I have a quite uh, astonishing message for you today. I think it's one of the most important things we could possibly discuss. Uh, if you know me, uh, you're probably sitting there waiting for me to start talking about uh, prophecy. But uh, uh, I'm not doing that today. I've spent uh, the last uh, 10 years or so studying prophecy. Um, the Lord has laid upon my heart uh, the drive to kind of know what the scriptures say about what's going to happen, possibly what's happening today, uh, and uh, spread that to uh, our youth as well as uh, some, uh, some groups that I've talked to. Uh, but uh, there was something uh, about 10 years ago that uh, kind of caught my eye while I was reading the scripture. It was in uh, uh, First Peter. Excuse me. Uh, let me read this verse to you. <clears throat> Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord as your life. And if you are asked about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. Well, I was, uh, uh, I'm 41 years old, and I gave my life to Christ in, uh, when I was 27. And uh, about 10 years ago, I was, I was reading through that, and I kind of just dismissed it right over because, you know, how can I give an account for what it is I believe? I really didn't know anything. Uh, and I was uh, fresh in my faith still, and uh, I still feel like I'm uh, growing. Uh, and it was really tough for me when I read that. I was like, well, I, what am I going to say? I, I don't know anything. I'm 30 years old, and uh, I have no evidence that uh, what I believe is true. And everybody else around me thinks it's a bunch of junk. How am I supposed to stand up and say anything? So I just kind of read over that. I believe what I believe because. You know, I just blind, blindly believe it. Uh, that isn't uh, necessarily uh, some evidence that's going to convince somebody otherwise. So I just kind of dismissed it and kept on doing my other studies. And it's kind of like a itch that you can't scratch. Uh, this was in the back of my mind uh, over the last 10 years in the summer. Um, I realized, you know, hey, um, I'm talking about all this stuff that we should know about, and I really don't know much about what I'm talking about. Uh, that's what it seemed to me. So uh, over the years, as I've studied, I kind of collected some, some pieces that were interesting. Uh, and this past summer, I read uh, some Josh McDowell books. And uh, these three individual books I read this summer was called Coffee, Coffee House Chronicles. And it's a, uh, a story with these uh, characters in it um, talking about uh, what atheists think and what uh, Christians think. And it takes place on a college campus, which kind of funny because my college campus is a, that's where a big struggle is happening uh, for the faith. And uh, it, it just goes on and, and talks about the main points of uh, what people say uh, why Christ uh, isn't God. And then uh, Josh and Sean McDowell will go ahead and uh, give some evidence for that. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I think you'll be able to walk away today with, uh, with a few points that uh, solidify what it is you at least have you think about it um, and possibly can share it with other people. So uh, one thing
thing that I'd uh, like you to think about is uh, the phone game. We've, I've talked about this before. <clears throat> when you pass along a message verbally, and it goes around the room and it comes back, uh, a lot of times uh, it's all garbled and not anywhere near the message you gave to begin with. And one of the things that uh, uh, opponents of Christianity say is that a lot of the Old Testament was handed down by word of mouth. But just like in this room, I'm standing up here talking to you about the things that uh, uh, the Bible says, and anybody in here could tell me that I'm wrong. Uh, I've talked to pastors before. I've, I've talked in front of uh, uh, lay people that I truly believe were a lot smarter than I am. And at any point in time, they could have pulled me aside and said, hey, that, that's not right. Uh, these people that passed down these messages did it in front of their communities, in front of the elders any point in time, they could have been uh, told it was wrong what they were saying. But, you know, uh, people who are critics of Christianity say, well, that's, that's not good enough. And it, it's amazing that uh, when you talk to people who don't believe, and you can tell right away whether or not you're going to have any impact on them at all, other than maybe planting a seed for, for the future. Uh, they're very... Uh, uh, strict in what they believe, and, and they're only willing to hear you so that they can tell you what they believe. Uh, maybe you've encountered them. Uh, but I teach 8th grade mathematics uh, at Western Middle School, and I taught six years at the high school at Tipton. And what I've found over the last uh, 10 years of teaching is that uh, once we took the Bible out of the schools, a lot of our kids don't know much. Uh, I have a... a so papers on, on uh, my counter that are the Ten Commandments, and I actually had a student come up to me once with this paper and ask me what they were. Uh, she didn't even know what the Ten Commandments were. So what's, what's this? What's this from? Uh, and that's kind of startled me. Now, we have some good students that, that know a little bit about their faith. But as we go, go through this and we realize that uh, people are, are struggling to even know what's going on in the world, they, there's further and further from uh, their faith, we got to come up with, with uh, ways, new ways to uh, talk about our faith to people because we're not doing it. Uh, it it's a struggle to, uh, to talk to people and you realize people aren't reading their Bible. They don't know a lot of stuff. And we come to groups like this and this is great. And I would say, uh, I, I don't know a lot of you in this room. I don't know if you read your Bible every day. I don't know if you witness to other people where you work. I don't know if you're comfortable speaking out about Christianity. But I have to say uh, this. Your God <clears throat> commands you to give an account for your faith. Your God commands you uh, to know what's in here. Uh, now, he's, he, he's not a uh, ruthless God. He's a very caring God. He's a very patient God. So we're here to talk about these things. And anybody, when I say any of this stuff, anybody can stop me and say that I I don't think that's what the Bible says, and we'll, we'll search it and figure it out. So we talked about this uh, talking in front of the community, and uh, there are other, other pieces of evidence as well. Uh, you have uh, eyewitnesses that can say whether or not they saw something. Uh, uh, people in here can say whether, whether or not somebody was here last year during these meetings, uh, or they saw them in church. Uh, there are eyewitness accounts of them, uh, atheists or uh, uh, critics of Christianity say, well, are you telling me that we actually have eyewitnesses to Jesus? And I say, well, not necessarily, but we have a lot of abstract evidence uh, that uh, can be pretty uh, uh, convincing even to uh, the biggest skeptic. So uh, one of the things I want to uh, start with is uh, the Bible and uh, Homer's Iliad. Did anybody read uh, Homer's Iliad? Anybody had to read that college or in high school had to read that? It's a poetic version of the Trojan Wars, and a lot of historians will take that as factual evidence uh, uh, for history. Uh, there are 600 manuscripts of Homer's Iliad. That's uh, a manuscript is a handwritten copy. So that's the biggest amount of handwritten copies we have of any document in the world besides the Bible. And the <coughs> earliest copy we have of Homer's Iliad uh, dates within 500 years of when the first book was actually written. And that's uh, pretty pretty cool. 500 years is not that bad. Uh, critics will say, well, the Bible's only within 1,000 years. So, you know, it really doesn't carry a lot of weight. And, and to 
that we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1952, and the whole book of Isaiah was found, and uh, that dates back to about between 100 and 200 BC. Now, if you haven't read chapter 53, you need to do that today. Chapter 53 in the book of Isaiah talks about Christ. <clears throat> and most people, when they read that, they think, this was written before Christ was born. And you're like, yeah, 100 to 200 years before Christ was born. So not only do we have Homer's Iliad and historians taking that as a fact, but all these critics, once you tell them that, they all give their lives to Christ. Right? No. Uh, the funny thing about critics is uh, it's, it's really hard to convince them. And really the best way to do that is just plant the seed. And that's kind of what we, we do with this. Is we say you can't refute. If you're going to say that Homer's Iliad is within 500 years and that's your basis for saying that, that it's factual, then you must, you must take what, what we have with the Dead Sea Scrolls as factual as well because that dated back to with, within 500 years of when the book of Isaiah was written, about 700 B.C. But then they say, well, that's that's not enough. That still doesn't prove Christ. Well, okay, let's let's talk about Christ. Because really, if, if we if we don't have Christ, we don't have Christianity, and there's no reason for us to be here, right? Okay, so we have all these these manuscripts. By the way, there's 40,000 manuscripts of the Old Testament alone. There's 25,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. Um, and the crazy thing about this is, uh, I, I read uh, that most mathematicians would agree, not Christian and Christian alike that it's an impossibility that the copies we have match what we have today. And so when we got the Dead Sea Scrolls, of course the critics were saying, ha, we're gonna sh we'll show you that uh, there, there's a big problem with this. And they, they dove into it and found that there weren't any mistakes. And that's pretty amazing, considering you're handwriting a copy and somebody else is handwriting it and so on. And you have 40,000 copies handwritten, and yet there aren't any so that's pretty convincing, but yet the critics still don't believe. So now we get down to business and we say, you know, let's just talk about Christ. That's really what we want to know. We believe blindly that, that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe blindly that, that he died on the cross. We believe blindly that the tomb was empty. We believe blindly that he rose from the grave. What can we possibly say that could convince anybody? Well, let's first talk about Jesus. Was he a real man? And we have historical um, documents dating back to the first century, like the latter part of the first century, where we have historians writing about this man, Jesus, and this person who performed and did some mighty things. Um, and uh, even our Muslim brothers uh, would agree that, uh, that uh, Jesus was a man. So we have some convincing evidence, I, I believe, that Jesus was real. And, and the skeptics would accept that. Any, any intelligent uh, person who does any research would say, okay, that, that's good enough. We'll, we'll, we'll give you that, that he was a man, he was real. Okay, well, if he was a man, then he must have died. Okay, either that or he's still walking around somewhere with Elvis and Michael Jackson. That's not the case. He must have died. And the thing about uh, uh, the Jews and, and death is they were very ritualistic. They were extremists in how they took care of their dead um, and made sure that the, that the bodies were taken care of. So we know that they really wanted to take care of this person that, that uh, these people thought was their God. Okay, there was a lot of people that thought Jesus was going to set them free, a lot of people that followed him, and they wanted to take care of him. And that's very, very important for the, for the next thing. Because, it, okay, he was alive, he died. So what? He's still not God. You, you, you still don't have half me yet. So what else you have? You say, well, what about the women that went to the tomb? So well, women, you know, we don't really listen to women back then. They, we don't care what they have to say. They obviously went to the wrong tomb. Uh, really? Really? They, these, these people who thought that Jesus was their Messiah, went to the wrong tomb. Does that make any sense? That they that they know exactly who this person was, they they took care of him, they wanted to make sure that the body was taken care of, and they went to the wrong tomb? 
oh, wait a minute, so they're stupid. And not only are they stupid, but the disciples that they went and got and brought back to the tomb, they're stupid too. They went to the wrong tomb as well. Not only that, but wait a second, didn't, didn't the Roman guards go to, go to the Pharisees and say that the tomb was empty? So they're stupid, and the Pharisees are stupid, because they all went to the wrong tomb and checked it out too. Are you telling me that all these people went to the wrong tomb because somebody had to go check it out? I, I'm not buying that argument that they went to the wrong tomb. Um, so let's let's just take a break for a second. Let's uh, talk talk about Osama bin Laden. We just hate this guy. We absolutely hate him, right? <laughs> who did we send after him? Who, who got it? Who can tell me who got it? The seals. The seals. The Navy seals. <coughs> the elite. The best of the best. Now these guys, they were given an order to go into this compound and, and get, get us on. Now they've been given an order. They hate this guy. They want this guy. They don't know for sure that he's there, but they say, you know, I've been given a command. I'm going to go into this building and I'm going to get this guy. So they get off the chopper and all of a sudden they stop in the tracks and they say, oh no, there's people with guns. And they get back on the chopper and they leave. Because they might die. That's not what they did, right? Okay, they hate this guy. They've been given a command, and they are not going to stop until they accomplish their, their mission. Would you agree? Okay, so they go in knowing that they could die for what it is they're trying to uphold. And uh, this command that's been given to them. The Roman guard was kind of like the Navy SEALs. They, uh, they were given a command to make sure that these crazy Jews don't go and steal the body. We want to make sure that that body stays in that tomb. So the Roman guards are, are placed there, and they've been given a mission. Not only that, but if they fail, it's on penalty of death. Do you really think that the disciples are going to go and overpower these Roman guards, break the seal on to roll the stone back, and take the body? Does that make sense to anybody? No, it doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, by the way, they take this beat-up body that's, you know, just looks terrible, and they take his clothes off. And, and then they take the naked body with it. Does that just sound a little strange to you? That sounds a little, a little odd to me. It doesn't make any sense that, that they could get by the... Uh, some people would actually say, well, what about the temple guard? What if they sent the temple guards uh, to, to watch them? There's ten of these in the temple guard. Um, if they were ever caught sleeping, they were beaten and uh, humiliated uh, and basically cast out uh, of the family, the Jewish family. So uh, you have uh, quite the argument that they were at the right to me, that the tomb was empty. So now we start the conspiracy theories. Uh, let's start with uh, the stolen body. I said they stole it. I, I already talked about that a little bit. Like, really, they, they couldn't have done that. And, and the other thing is, let's talk about what these disciples did afterwards. What did they do? They went throughout the country. They went into different territories by themselves. They weren't a cult. They weren't a cult that got together in a room like this and said, hey, that asteroid is passing Earth and that comet's coming close. Let's all take some poison together and we'll hop on and, and the 25 of us that are in here, uh, we're the only ones that God really loves, so we'll take our poison, we'll die, and we'll, we'll go get on the, uh, the comet together. And every, the other 6 million people will be left behind. That doesn't make any sense. The disciples didn't get together in a room um, like a cult and make themselves feel good and say, like, okay, you, you take your, your poison and I'll take it too, and we'll do it together. No, they went separate, <laughs> separately into, uh, into the world preaching about a lie. Yeah. Does that make any sense that, you know, for their pride they wanted to preach about a lie? That, that they uh, uh, were beaten, thrown in jail, spit on everywhere they went? And then they were crucified and individually. They were put on a cross just because they wanted to make sure that 
they cover up this, this lie they've been talking about. Oh, wait a second, we, we forgot a whole bunch of stuff. What about all the other people that saw Jesus afterwards? That said they saw Jesus. Of course, they must have been hallucinating. That's the, that's the next theory. They must have been hallucinating. Psychologists would agree that uh, uh, maybe, maybe two people could have the same hallucination at the same time. Maybe. We're not talking about two people. We're talking about all the disciples and at different times. We're talking about 500 plus people um, in 1 Corinthians. In chapter 15, I'm going to read that in a minute uh, when we finish. Uh, but all these people hallucinated. That, is, that doesn't make any sense either. So you have all these disciples going to their death, a brutal death, living a horrible life, going preaching about Jesus. Um, and, and they die for a lie. Or the other conspiracy theory is that they they went and got somebody who kind of looked like Jesus, beat the crap out of him so he couldn't tell who he was, and then gave him to the Roman soldiers and said, here, crucify this guy. This is Jesus. Okay, first of all, how did that all play out? How did they sneak this, this guy uh, in between all of these Roman guards and uh, so they, this guy could be uh, uh, crucified instead of Christ. That doesn't make any, any sense to me. Uh, and, and so let's say that they actually did that. So again, the disciples go to their deaths while Jesus is out walking around free. Okay, that isn't somebody got a cave? Okay, that, it, it's a little strange to me all of these things that, that uh, the critics are coming up with and it, it, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, we don't have any physical evidence of, of, of Christ. Um, I can't give you anything other than, than these abstract thoughts and address the things that people say um, are against Christianity. So these things make me believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that, the, that Jesus was a real person. He died, was put in a tomb, the tomb was empty, he rose from the grave. Now, what, what about that? You know, the, the, the stone was rolled away. Was that so Jesus could come out? Or was it to show the people that he was not in there? It was to show people he wasn't in there. Jesus didn't need an angel to come and roll, to, to roll away the stone. Okay? So he really was God. He, he uh, did what he said he did. The Bible is true. It's factual. Archaeologists use the Bible to help go and find, uh, dig up things that uh, are over in that, in that land that the Bible said was real, that critics say is not real. Did you know in 1985, <clears throat> the U.S. News World Report uh, talked about archaeologists uh, digging up uh, uh, some tablets that had King David's uh, uh, signature and stuff on it, dating back to the time of King David. And before 1985, those critics said that he was just a myth. It's crazy the things that we dig up, and yet we don't really shout to people that disbelieve. They why, why would you not believe that? There's tons of evidence out there for the Bible. There's abstract evidence for Christ. There isn't really anything in here that we can talk about that, that is critical to say, oh, this really doesn't make any sense. It all makes sense. So I would say uh, from the beginning, we need to be reading this because the more we read it, the more we understand. The more things we find, yeah, the more things you learn, the more things you realize you don't know, and it's kind of scary. And sometimes that makes us feel like, oh wait, let's, I, I like my life the way it is. I like my security of not knowing anything. And whenever somebody asks me about why it is I believe what I believe, I'll just say, you know, I believe out of faith. And, and then you walk away and you feel bad because that person actually needed, needed some guidance. And I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm saying, I'm in a room full of men, and we're supposed to give an account for what it is we believe, and it's hard to do. That's why we're here. So I've given you some things to think about, and I'd like to close with a reading from 1 Corinthians 15. Now let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then and still do now. For your faith is built on this wonderful message. 
And it is in the good news that saves you if you firmly believe it. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. That Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and the followers at one time. Most of whom are still alive, though some have died by now. Then he was seen by James, and later by all the apostles. Last of all, I saw him too, long after the others, as though I had been born at the wrong time. You know, we have uh, 3,000 people at Pentecost coming to know the Lord. If they were alive at the time, at any point in time, they could have said none of this happened. No one was refuting that these things happened. But the critics are just saying, well, the tomb was empty because somebody stole it. They all lose it. That makes no sense to me. Um, I'd like to end in prayer if you don't mind. Dear Heavenly Father, um, thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for uh, all the years of all the hard work that went into uh, copying it down. Uh, the word of mouth and all the people who were loyal to it. Thank you so much for these men that are in here today to hear it. Uh, thank you for the ability to make some sense out of things that uh, seem to be overwhelming to us. Help us to go throughout the world and making disciples of all nations. Help us to help those around us. Help us to teach our children uh, what it is they need to know. They're thirsting for it, Lord. They're waiting on it. Give us the boldness. Help us to uh, uh, be calm to be graceful as we talk about you to others that might not know who you are. Uh, thank you again, Lord. Bless us and uh, bring us back again safely. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.